I ain't gonna lie, that actually oh. liked be probably my top five favorite movie of all time, bro. That turned me up as a young dude. That movie was awesome, man. So we're here with the actual Jordan Belfort. Jordan yep. Belfort. Y'all ever heard that song? No. Mm -hmm. I've been getting dirty money, Jordan Belfort. Who, who that that song? Song? penny stocks. Like, who I don't even know what it's that called. Song. That's a banger, though. I used to love that, like, senior high school. Okay, so Tucker has Jordan. I didn't think that was a weird combination. I didn't think these two would link up. But that, I that, guess they're going to talk about, you know, some corrupt politicians we're doing the nancy pelosi time stamp yeah guys he'll watch the whole interview he's but gonna talk he's about, gonna talk about nancy pelosi yes but didn't he do some himself that was illegal so yeah he was he was uh scamming money. off penny stocks or yeah. something like that hey no he keeping it on he's open to the you know saying but he's not running for president yeah he was like, <laughs> he's like famous because he did something illegal but did he i don't know did he touch jail time though? hell yeah i think he, like he didn't do too much but he did some yeah i think um, he got hit up for money embezzlement he did yeah he was doing a lot of stuff bro he was just going up he was just too yeah. turned <laughs> he was like he was like trying to hide money in a different country and shit he's savage well hearing about corrupt politicians is very interesting so guys so let's see what he had to say this about guy's it. A, a white collar criminal i feel like that's way more respectable than blue collar. <laughs> <laughs> i mean like seriously like this guy's getting an yeah. interview you yeah. know what i'm saying it is definitely yeah, yeah. he's getting yeah. a freaking interview it appears that members of congress consistently beat the s p 500 in their personal investment nancy pelosi and a lot of others, right. and Pelosi especially. But she's the famous one. Yeah. yeah. So how does that, is Nancy Pelosi, do you think, a stock picking genius? No, she, she has to be operating on information that's non-public. Well, there's not, well, wouldn't that say, make her a criminal? Yeah, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> look at Joe Biden right now. I mean, <laughs> look what's going on right now. Like, yeah. this, listen. Do you I think was, he's a good stock picker? Joe Biden, no, I think he's great at laundering money, though. Yeah, I mean, honestly, apparently. What, from what I've seen right now, I don't get it. Like, just imagine if it was Trump who was president. Yeah. But every single day in the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and every other publication would be like $40,000 check for $20,000 check from his, his brother. Like, it'd be game over. Cries for impeachment. Oh, yeah. It'd be like the world falling down. He's in China's pocket. But it's like we're living in an alternative universe right now where people in power, especially on the, on the, on the left, right? can operate almost with impunity. And Pelosi is a perfect example. She's not the only one, but it's inconceivable that someone could have that high return in the market when everyone else can't do it. So what's the edge? The edge is she knows key legislation. And also, you know, maybe someone's whispering in her ear, okay? Because, you know, they want to be on our good side, right? So it's, it's hard to prove So, though. But it's just prima facie though. So if, you, if what you're saying is true, and that is that the most sophisticated politician people in the world can't beat the S&P average. Right. Than any member of Congress, and I think they are on average dumber than than the population, especially the career politicians. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Wow. There's no possibility they could do that with that inside information. Then. No, it's not possible. But again, so how do you go proving that? Right? They have to issue subpoenas. And listen, I think that the, in, in this case, the solution is they shouldn't be allowed to trade these people. Yes. They should not be allowed to trade. It's insane that they're allowed to, and you know, as you said, it's privatization. Wow. Right? You know, if it looks like shit, smells like shit. Well, guess what? Yeah, it's shit. Then that's you know. Yeah, that should be illegal, days, right? That should so, definitely be listen, illegal. She's done incredibly well in an I mean, area where out. like the most professional investors struggle to even match the index. That's so somehow she's doing three times as well. So I she's like basically taking the Why test and already having the answers. That seriously, I mean this is like, like a feature of. <laughs> no, this is actually. But that, that policy, but that makes sense though, because when you look at the net worth of a lot of these politicians and people that are in politics, they have crazy money. Yeah, they and do. like when you look up their salary online, it's nowhere near what they're worth. Wow. So that makes sense to me. It's kind of like the refs being able to bet, you know, or a coach being able. They to probably bet. is doing that. No, they definitely are. I mean, you could just tell somebody else to bet. for Couple have been caught. But look, you know, that should be illegal. They should make a law behind that, to be honest with you, because that I feel like they're selling out the American people for a dollar. <sighs> That's insane. But you know, well, they should break bread. Area where like the most professional investors struggle to even match the index. So somehow she's doing three times as well. I don't know. Damn. Why is no one ever taking that seriously? I mean, this is like, like a feature of internet media. Did I go forward or something? No, you went, I went back. back. You went back. But I don't know. I mean, don't we have an SEC to look into that? I mean, what? SEC is not going to look into that sort of stuff because they don't. They don't want to make an enemy because they're funded. Who funds them? You know, they're funded by Congress. The budget's tied to Congress, right? There's a committee that's it's the um, so they're all working services committee, co right? together so that, that basically to cheat. But how does it make you feel? I mean, you got in a lot of trouble for mm. fraud, but I deserved it. So like, I, I, right? But so do they? Yeah, I know. But like, I, I never. 
one thing, listen, I admit that after 2008, I got a little bit bitter. I was like, you know what? These people have bankrupted the world economy and, yeah. and no one went to jail, basically. Some one schnook in Germany went to jail, yeah, exactly. right? So I was a little, I said, you know what? That's not really fair, but you know, I don't that think is it's, you know, an empowering way to live to say just because you know I went to jail, other people should go too. I think jail's a terrible place, right? And um, you know, I did my time and um, and I made the best that I wrote my first book in jail, right? Which is turned out to be a great thing. But you know, oh, I well, learned that, but I don't then wish mm -hmm. it on other people. How did people. you I mean a lot of people go to jail, few write books. How right. did you how did you do that? It's a great story. So believe it or not, when I go to jail, right? How old are you? Uh, let's see, so I was uh, 41 years old, 42. Ooh, yeah. Dang. It's a terrible time to go to jail, right? I Almost thought everything, he would have been like right? way younger. Um, two and kids? I go, well, I two kids at the time, yeah, which was breaking the news to them was the most heartbreaking thing ever. I mean, like, literally, it was like a, too much crying. And they say how often they about it, right? I bet. And I had to tell them, like, you know, daddy made mistakes, and now he's in the you know, hysterical. They were 11 and 9 at the time, right? So, um, I go to jail, and it's not the worst jail in the world. I'm not worried about slipping months. in the shower. So it's like a yeah. minimum so security for jail year, socks, right? Who's my bunkmate? Tommy Chong <laughs> from Cheech and Chong. Ooh, he <laughs> what? So he's there for selling, not marijuana, oh, but- bongs. Bongs. It was the most ridiculous <laughs> thing what? ever. So he's That's doing insane. a year and a day, a year and a day, for selling bongs. I'm like, shit, I'm like, he's doing a year and a day for bongs. Yeah, like, selling like bongs is actually crazy. He only got two years. Pause, 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 pause. 22 months, Yeah. right? All that money he fr that he did for fraud, he only got two it's years. Non violent crime, and he got the best lawyer. Yeah, bro, he's rich, bro. I told you, it's white collar crime. <laughs> <laughs> that is insane, though. Like, like I bet he was in the best. It's, it's really best like he did. Too. He did like the big one of the biggest finesses and got a slap on the wrist for it. That let me know. That's quite literally what happened. If you thug that, in, we gonna let him finish this story. Are we gonna go to the, the beginning a little you bit? You probably going because I think the beginning is the more interesting timestamp. So well, I, was, I, I was, I was, I was enjoying. No, yeah, what no, yeah, no, yeah, no, I'm finna, we're gonna keep continuing the story though. But why, why, so they was trying to make people that got hit up for the PPP? I don't think many people got Yeah, it. I don't think too many people uh, no, went to jail for many. that. But I've seen people get some. People are getting going, getting so, in trouble for that, like now. I've yeah, seen some people, people getting some. Some like, people went for like $75,000. You like saw that. how much money he, like, think about how much money he had for fraud. Yeah, millions, bro. Yeah, he had millions. So millions. you telling me. You they probably only got the best lawyer. One or two months, though. You telling me for the PPP loan. People are doing they, years for that, aren't they're they? They're doing like five, I thought, yeah. five, ten. Yeah, he's right. That was right. His lawyer. Well, Taj. Uh, well, man, no, 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 no. Bro, I had looked up some of the cases for the PPP loan, bro. They can't put, 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 pay their lawyer. Put, put, put. They had about seven put, 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 million. They he tweeted. can pay his lawyer. 15 years. I'm Damn. telling you, I had seen 10, well, 15. They got 20 million, though. 20 million gets you 15 years in jail. You could. Oh. You can do up to 30. Damn. That one messed up right now, dude. I on, told you, bro. He got a slap on the wrist, bro. Former yeah, NFL yeah. player sentenced to 37 months in, in prison for PVP fraud case. Hold on, no, hold on. What's his name? I don't know. Uh, it, Joshua it. Bellamy. Bellamy. Oh, Bellamy. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who the hell that is. Yeah, yeah no. So no, Tennessee they, woman, seven, eight months for PPP. Jo 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 uh, Jordan Belfort got a slap on the wrist for what yeah, he, he did. did. He did. Let's, uh, did. let's finish did. this. Though. That let's is get back insane. Into it. Let's get back into <laughs> it, though. That is crazy. So he's there for a year and a day. Yeah, and, weird. you know, the first few days, you know, some you know, people say. Two, so you just tell each other stories. And I'm telling him stories about my life, the insanity. And did you know who he was? Of course. Yeah, they put us together. And we, shared a, we shared a cell. Yeah. Because I think we were both high profile. So they just put us together, right? So they could watch us both at once, right? And so in jail, as crazy. in normal life, all the famous people know each other. Basically, right? Yeah. So and he's a great, he's a great guy. And he was, he was writing a book at the time. And I'm telling him stories. And he's just rolling, just laughing hysterically every night, right? And the third night, he's like, you know, I thought you were making this shit up. But my wife Googled you. And it's like all true. In fact, your sister knows you from her father from back in the day. He was a friend of mine, right? He's like, this is, you actually sank the boat. You crashed these cars. You did all this insane. You made all this money and all these drugs. He goes, you have to write a book. And I'm like, really? You think my life's exciting? Like, because when it's your life, no matter how crazy your life is, it's yours. You don't of think, course. right? You think it's just normal. I'm like, he's like, I'm Tommy Chong. I think your life is just insane. He goes, write a book. So I, I started trying to write and I was a terrible writer. Terrible. I couldn't write anything. I'd never written before like that, you know? So after like a month, I'm like, oh, this is just not working. I'm, I go to the prison library and I stumble upon a book called prison Bonfire of the Valleys yeah, yeah, by Tom that. Wolf. Yeah, I yeah, pick yeah. up this book and I'm like, Angola. oh my God. So it was I a minimum security like prison. This. So I, I plowed through the book and then I, I started again with the yellow highlight and I used this book so like a textbook. 
and I taught myself to write by modeling Tom Wolfe. So it's like I had a model now, and I spent about three months just every, I mean, every metaphor, how he used grammar, how he described locations, how he used conflict, and I really started to see my writing dramatically improve. So I wrote about 100 pages when I was in jail, and then I ripped them up. I didn't think they were good enough. I got out of jail with no pages, but I had a skill now, right? So when I got out, crazy. <laughs> I was like, you know, I don't know what to do with my life. And I was like, maybe I'll just start trying to write again, right? So I wrote about 12 pages and I'm like, wow, I think those are really good. Like I thought they were pretty good and I hate my own writing always, right? It's like when you write, you write it's very, you're like you always hate what you write, right? So I'm like, I think these are pretty good. I sent them to a few friends and they're like laughing, like, oh my God, it's the funny. I'm like, really? So I sent it to a book agent. I knew very casually, just a casual friend, right? So I called him and said, I want to, you know, write a book. He goes, oh, great. Let's get you a ghostwriter. I said, well, I want to write myself. He goes, can you write? I'm like, I'll send you the pages. I sent him 12 pages. Next day, he calls me back. He goes, did you pay Tom Wolf to write those pages? It was like that close to Tom Wolf's voice, my first draft, right? I'm like, no, no, I wrote it myself. He's like, it's really good. He goes, like, write 10 more pages. So I said, all right. So it took about a, it took me a week to write 10 more pages. I wrote another 10 pages. I sent him the pages. 15 minutes later, he calls me. He goes, stop everything you're doing. You have no idea what's about to happen to your life. This book is going to be a master hit. Master hit. I'm going to get a movie made about this. We're going to get Leo DiCaprio to play you, right? Oh, that's, that's crazy. crazy. Damn. Right? I was like, I thought he was delusional, right? That's but I didn't have much going did. on back then, right? So I was like, screw it. So I you know, hold up and literally I had a little tiny apartment and I spent one year just like doing 18 hours a day writing the book, The Wolf of Wall Street, right? About on page 60, he took it down to Random House who bought the book. I got a nice advance so I could at least live, right? And then when the book was finished about a year later, it went through seven edits because I overwrote it. Got it from 1,000 pages down to 500 pages. And then when it was still a manuscript, it became a bidding war between Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, so it, was, it wasn't even a book Amazing. yet. I know, it was crazy, right? And then, you know, Leo brought in Scorsese and I was well, Leo's job, and I sold to Leo. He did his job, so man. Like Christ, man. Bidding war and Christ, so began, movie. you know, the story of The Wolf of Wall Street, what happened with the movie. And then there was a delay, by the way, for five years, because that was 2007. And then the writer's strike hit and it got delayed, which ended up being a great thing. And this is really empowering for all, all the listeners. I'll tell you why. Because when, I, when they wrote the, the script, when the script was done by a guy named Terry Winter, who adopted the book, he did an incredible job. The first draft of the script was amazing, right? But it ended with me in jail, like because I went to jail and got out, right? And that was the ending of the movie, of the script, right? There was this delay then for four years after the writer's strike. And during those four years, I got very wealthy again, going out there and speaking and training entrepreneurs and teaching sales, right? So finally, four years later, when Leo called me, goes, we're ready to go. He came back to my new house. I was living in a mansion on the water. He's like, what the hell happened to you? Like in four years, I was in a tiny apartment, now into a very nice house again. And I'm like, oh, I'm doing this stuff around the world. And I showed him my clips from live on stage. He's like, wait till Marty sees this. He's going to go crazy. They rewrote the third act of the movie and made it a comeback story. So that's, yes, yeah, so I kind of and rewrote my life story. When were you that's happy so good. at the yeah. peak of your success, pre-conviction or on the comeback? Comeback. I was yeah. never happy before. Why? Number one, I was a massive drug addiction. Yeah. Like well, I'm literally massive drug addiction. What you were know? you using? Quaaludes and cocaine. Quaaludes? Quaaludes, yes. Yeah. What is a Quaalude? I hear about that. I remember he kept saying that in the movie, and I'm just like, like what is it? It's a pregnant woman. A lot right here. It's a pregnant woman. It's like, oh, damn, I wanted to hear. You were, no, it's just going to talk about addiction, bro. We don't want to hear that, bro. Let's get to But a Quaalude talk. is like, they used to give it to pregnant women to, like, I think, calm them down or something, but it, it leave said, you high. It, it, yeah, the sleep. It was like a sleep. That's aid. what. Oh, wow. That's what Bill Cosby got hit up with the women. It was for Quaaludes. They was popping those back in the 80s, I think. Really? The closer you've been following your equity investments recently, the jumpier you likely are. A lot of Americans have concluded that the Wall Street game may be rigged. The whole thing is kind of a scam, but there's still a huge amount of money tied up in it. Not just in individual investing, of course, but in pension funds. The whole world is tied up in the American stock market. So how exactly do you succeed in it as an individual? We thought the man to ask would be the man who's seen both sides of this business, legitimate and less than, Jordan Belfort, The Wolf of Wall Street, with a new book, The Wolf of Investing. And he joins us now to explain how you can make a fortune on Wall Street. <laughs> well, well, can you make a fortune you, on Wall Street? You can, but it takes time. You know, I think, it, I think listen, the, the mistake that people make is that, the average person, is that when you don't have that much money to start, let's just choose a number, let's say just $10,000, yeah. right? It's a random number, right? You say to yourself, 
if I'm going to really get anywhere as an investor, I need to make a big hit. I like to turn that into like a million bucks. I've got to find the next Apple computer, the next crazy crypto token, right. whatever it might be, some wildly successful investment, right? Which leads you to engage in you know, wild speculation, short-term trading, trying to time the market. And the truth is, is the opposite. You don't need to start with a lot of money to end up with a lot of money by doing the exact opposite, which is holding for the long term mm -hmm. That's and, and all the highest quality says. stocks and in relying on long term compounding and reinvesting every dividends and making small contributions along the way. But forgetting, like you said, the noise and people are worried about their equities. This is the problem because as soon as you start buying into that, like, you know what, I think the market might be going down or maybe it's going to go up next year. And you should have to time that by buying and selling. You create taxable events. And also, human beings, by our nature, we're kind of crappy stock pickers. And when you try to pick individual stocks, you tend to lose most of the Wait, time. Okay, so what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you sense. my investment strategy. Okay. And I'm going to be as honest as I can be. Sure. And you assess it based on your expertise and tell me if Let's I'm right or wrong. Okay, so I'll get out of my rec room, big screen TV with my dab pen and my laptop. And I'll turn on Jim Cramer on CNBC. <laughs> And then if he tells me to buy, I buy. And if he sells, says sell, I sell. Yeah. You're getting financially whipsawed. So I, I think I quote, Is that working for me? No, it's not going to work. So I, I, I kind of bury Kramer in the book. I guess I'm not going on CNBC anytime soon for any Why interviews. Why would you bury Jim Kramer? I, I mean, this is a guy with an uninterrupted string of correct <laughs> calls. Buy. <laughs> JP Morgan of this generation. Sam Bankman Freed's FTX. Listen, the best thing, uh, the best thing was is the interrupted string of That is actually calls. funny. Like, as well, fuck. Listen, he's had a lot of good calls because he's on both sides of the market. He tells you to buy one thing on Monday that, and sell though. it on Wednesday and back and vice versa. This guy literally is telling you, you they actually did a study on this. Explain it, Brendan. Uh, Sam Bankman Freed, uh, FTX, it was like a huge scam. I think he ran up like a bunch of money and it turned out to be like a oh, whole, he like scam people. He just told people to buy it. So Hell yeah. So sure he just went to, yeah. I think, I think he I just went to jail. He was like, he just like co signed it on CNBC. He just went to jail recently. It was like crazy. Let's see. A lot of YouTubers, a lot of YouTubers were, uh, it wasn't illegal, but it was immoral. They're telling all these people to get these cryptos and then just selling it. Yeah, he, 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 sc he scammed like a billion dollars. <laughs> he scammed over a billion dollars. That's what happened to Shiba. That yeah, one that we all yeah, it's, it's, it says he's face, he faces up to 110 years in prison. Damn! Mm -hmm. Bro, he scammed up to a billion dollars. Like multi-billion dollars. How much he, how much time he got? They say he faced up to 110 years. That's, like, that's funny as fuck, though. Sam Bankman Freed's oh. FTX. Why? Man, that's probably <laughs> that's yeah. Why he only yeah. got two years? He interrupted a string of terrible know. calls. But, oh, listen, he's had a lot of good calls because he's on both sides of the market. He tells you to buy one thing on Monday and sell it on Wednesday and back and vice versa. This guy literally is telling you, you they actually did a study on this where they put up his recommendations of what he said on, on Monday and then a Friday, the exact opposite. Like one day he's saying the market's going up, next day it's going down, buy this, go from this sector to that sector. That's a historically, They're mathematically, scientifically proven to be the worst possible way to invest your money. They've gone back a hundred years, the scientific, the academic studies, and the analysts can't pick the right stocks. The hedge fund managers and the mutual fund managers can't beat the S&P 500, no this. which is the overall broader yeah, market. And there's a reason for that because all the information is out there. So unless you have inside information, which is illegal, right? And certainly the average person is not going to have that. Or some other way to beat the market, whether it's you know high frequency trade with computers that are lightning fast. So some of the big firms, they'll time the market like a, a millionth of a second better than an average investor, they get an edge. But for everyone else, you can't beat the market. You just It doesn't work, especially when you deduct all the fees, sounds just like the commissions, gambling. and also the taxes from short-term trading. So let's say let's say a hedge fund returns 15% one year. Say, well, that's pretty good, right? But after they take their 2% manager fee, 20% performance bonus, right? Suddenly it's not even beating the S&P 500. And that's in a good year. Most of the time they don't even beat it without their fees. So why would anyone hand money to a hedge fund? So Warren Buffett asked this exact question back in 2007, made a, made a, a big announcement, bet a million bucks that I don't care whatever hedge fund you are, you can't beat the S&P 500 over 10 years. And at first, no one took Man. the bet. Eventually, someone did with a, what's called a fund of funds. It was a hundred yeah, yeah. different funds, right? And after year seven, they threw in the towel. They couldn't even come close to the so S&P. And that was without bet, all their fees. Bet, and just so you know, the put on the S&P 500. So 20% of the performance the bonus, right? right? If the fund That's makes the, money. Yeah, off yeah. the upside. On the upside. But if the fund loses money the following year, they don't get any of the losses. So it's heads they win, tails you lose, right? 
the mutual fund industry is equally bad. So they're engaging in, you know, basically asset gathering because what they do is they try to gather as many assets as possible, money, right? Because they get their management fees. But the returns on the average mutual fund are like scam. They don't keep up with the S&P 500, which is America's 500 biggest, baddest, most profitable companies. So, and that, those 500 companies change. So not this, the S&P this year is not the same as it was last year. So what happens when you buy that index as the centerpiece of your investments, right? And just hold it. You're always having the 500 top high performing companies in your portfolio is very tax efficient. Now it's boring, but it compounds at about 11% a year. Definitely is boring. And guess what? It doesn't matter. If you invest $10,000, right? And just compounds at 11% a year. You put a little extra money in whenever you can each month, each quarter, right? Over 30 years, 40 years, it turns into millions of dollars. But I, I'm, I'm still hey. caught up in the hedge fund idea. Oh, yeah. So Steve Cohen, Ray Dalio, was, right. all these guys smart. are billionaires. Right. So you have the world's biggest art collections. So how did they get so rich if it doesn't work? Well, for a time, it was like, the you know, everyone thought, oh, my God, they're so great, the hedge fund. So for many in the 90s and 2000s, like this, the word was really like this mystique that you had these really high performing hedge funds. And there were a few. There were, there were a few people that actually can beat the market. Ray Dalio is one who's done it consistently. He's not taking your money. The average, you know, when they're really that good, they don't take an average investor's money. They train their own money in a few very, very large institutions. So those funds are not open to the average investor. But then all the other hedge funds, which kind of suck, right? Interesting. They're bathing in the afterglow of the aura of the hedge fund manager we see like on billions, right? So you're just a mystical hedge fund. Manager. Well, guess what? Most of these guys suck. All right, they they're not beating the S. They're just not. It's mad. It's historically proven. They don't beat the S and P. That's and they crazy. Put these massive fees it makes, when they do. It makes complete sense. It does make sense. It's the best five hundred countries in the United States. So 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 imagine a billion dollars. So b before you even start, world, it's, it's twenty million too. a year you're getting. Just in a, but when, before the fund even starts, plus twenty percent of all the profits. And when you take those and how about this? I'll go one step further. And also, when you have a hedge fund, you have to show activity. Because unless you're, you can't just buy the S&P and hold it. Cause someone will say, well, why would I give you my money? You're not doing anything. So they almost have to show activity to justify their existence, mm -hmm. which makes them engage in short-term trading. And human beings are just terrible market timers. They, and this is just over, it's proven over a hundred plus years of studies that you cannot trade in and out of the stock market, buying, selling, selling, buying sector, this sector one day. So it's just a trap. The way I look at it is this, so Wall Street, creates massive value. They do. Wall Street's necessary. You can hate Wall Street, despise them for what they think they do wrong, but Wall Street is necessary. They create massive value for the economy. They take companies public, right? They finance the growth of America. It's needed. They maintain the debt markets, the credit markets. That's the useful side of Wall Street, where they create massive value. Then there's the not so useful, the dark side of Wall Street, where they create bubble after bubble after bubble, where they have instruments of financial mass destruction they create for just gambling purposes where they churn you they have excess commissions and fees and rob the public blind so the question like in the book was you know how does the average person get the maximum exposure to the good side of wall street which is the great companies they take public and finance that become huge multinationals so how do you maximize that but avoid the corruption well, the churning and the burning and the you know financial bubbles and so forth try to and, and play into what I call the Wall Street theme machine complex, which is this advertising monolith where basically they convince you, like people like Kramer, to play the sucker's game. With actively, if you go on CNBC, they're all day long trying to convince people to play the short-term trading game, which is indeed a sucker's game. So you go into a casino, right? We spoke about uh, about Kerry Packer, right? Gambling, yeah. right? So they own casinos, the Packer family, right? So in a casino, you you go in there knowing that the odds are against you by what five percent, depending on what game you play. So the odds are against you, and the house will win over time, right? That's a legit casino. The odds are against you. But what if you go into a corrupt casino where they have loaded dice and a dealing from the bottom of the deck? That's Wall Street. So now not only are the odds against you because you know it's hard to pick winning stocks, but there's people who have information that's more timely than you. 
they're trading ahead of you. Oh, yeah, they yeah, are charging yeah. excess fees. And also, you have all these publications and new chat and, and news, whether it's CNBC, Bloomberg isn't as bad, right? Because they cater mostly to professionals, but still trying to convince people that, you know, you could somehow figure out when you should buy oil and then sell your meta and then somehow go into a steel stock and then go into over. <laughs> it should <laughs> never be a system. It literally never and people get system. financially whipsawed. And I saw it myself, my own family member. Very successful guy. I start my book off telling his story. About your brother-in-law. Yeah, my brother-in-law. He's, he's a very smart guy. And he's. I watched his portfolio get decimated through short-term trading and using margin, all the things that they... Was he doing it himself? He was trying to do it himself and, you know, following tips he heard on TV or online. And, and it's just... And it's so simple. And what happened to him? Well, he's, thankfully, he's successful. He lost a lot of money. And then he learned his lesson. And I showed him what to do the right way. And he now he's building a, a proper portfolio for the long term. So... I think the distinction is this. You can get rich in the stock market, but not overnight. It's just, it's, it's, it doesn't work. You can't do that. And if you try That's to real. get rich by engaging in short-term trading or picking like one stock, you're probably going to end up in the financial poorhouse. Damn. So the solution I That's put in this so book, real. which is ironic of where I came from, right? Because I came in for 30 years ago, like right? That. So I, as you said, I've seen both sides, right? So the solution in the book is, is really very simple to build a world-class portfolio and secure your future. Because I don't think you can rely on social security these days. You don't have to pay for your diapers when you're in a nursing home by the time That's you right. get it, right? So this is about you know, empowering yourself financially and it's about doing less versus more. Not hiring experts. Time. Less trading yourself. Less trade. It's about investing as opposed to speculating. Now, there's nothing wrong with speculating. It's fun, right? And if you want to take 5% of your capital and speculate and buy and sell, and that's great. There's nothing she wrong with that. Now, I encourage people know. to do that because it's good. You can have fun with that. Maybe you'll make some Don't. money. But that's not how you secure your retirement. If you want to secure a great retirement, yeah, he's you right. start off young as possible, right? And it's never too late, by the way. And it doesn't matter how much money you have. To you can start with a little bit of money. You don't need a lot. But the key is making little, small, regular contributions and not worrying. Just to an index fund? Is that what you're it, saying? It, well, um, the main one is an index fund. You want to have an index fund, S P low-cost S&P 500 index fund. And you want to have it in certain types of accounts that are tax-deferred whenever possible and so forth, right? Then you also want to balance that out. With some, you need to have some bonds in there, a small amount depending on your age, right? And on top of that, some cash for an emergency. And then if you want to speculate, you can have, let's say, 5% for speculation. But the key is this don't hire an expert. Like, for example, we've been conditioned, and this is the trap, right? So a lot of people get hit online. Right? With that so if your, your pipes in your house burst, you probably do a lot better off calling a plumber to fix your pipes than trying to fix them yourself, right? Right. Right. Fair enough, right? If you have an electric short, I suggest you call an electrician uh, versus you, trying you to go always... put on rubber gloves and not get electrocuted. You'll get a much better result with the expert in that too. If you're sick, let's say your appendix is about to burst, right? Don't do your own surgery. Have your wife cut you open. Go to a doctor that's an expert at doing surgery. Let him do the surgery. Fair. Fair enough, right? That's true for almost all things in life, except Wall Street. It's the one exception to the otherwise pretty much steadfast rule about seeking out experts to help you get the best result. On Wall Street, they don't get you a better result than doing it yourself. They get you a worse result because of all the fees, the commissions, the damn, performance damn, bonuses, damn, and damn, also damn, damn, they damn. can't outguess the market. The market is too hard to beat. Now, you have, again, there's a few people that can do it. They're not taking your money. The moral of the story is invest in S&P 500. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's looking like, man. In Apple. And quick money ain't real. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's no. Not. That's it's very. Uh, it was very interesting listening to him talk. I definitely enjoyed it. I'm gonna uh, watch that myself. That yeah, no, facts. very interesting. I really like. I really like Tucker's show and who he brings on. Oh yeah, yeah Tucker's. It's going, very, very interesting. Always. Tucker's going very crazy right now. It's called the Tucker Carlson Encounter. I feel like a lot of people need to watch that video. They need to put that on in school. No, <laughs> facts. Forex no. traders. I, 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 would, I would actually. I would actually love to like have him teach me how to properly trade stocks. They just put that video on in school. But Maybe I mean, like, I, I've seen. A, I don't know, bro. I just. Well, we should have known when. So, they Everybody knows so the Forex trader stuff. Uh, Y'all don't probably He's know Joe Fair. I never what the hell is Joe Fair doing then? He is doing day trading, but he have like a large sum of money. Like you had to have like twenty bands, thirty bands to like get. I'm seeing a guy named Joe Fair, guys, putting in a thousand dollars and literally coming up with twelve thousand dollars in a day. He's getting lucky. Yeah, he is probably just getting lucky though. He ain't recorded it. I don't know though, but because like, well, I mean, he was no, no, everybody would just do that shit. It's kind of difficult to get on him though. 
But if, if it was going to guarantee you a thousand, yeah, it's not going to guarantee. It's not guaranteed. He said you're going to lose money for sure. Oh, well, yeah, that's yeah, what I mean. I've seen people, yeah, yeah. He said it. You yeah, play no, the house, you lose. You're going to lose money for sure. But he is hitting, though. That's why so I stopped like, betting. But yeah, that might be the 5% rule, but I don't know. You know, I guess that that is true. You can't really ask an expert, man. All these courses and shit, everybody just trying to rob you. Hell yeah. Now, that was very interesting, guys. That that was that was awesome, man. But, well, we know what these politicians is doing, too. That That's... They get the lick. Inside. They got the inside on everything, guys. That, is that what Al Capone and them? Y'all know how uh, they said the, um, the gangsters back in the day used to own banks and shit like that? Al Capone was like a mafia boss. Yeah, but they said he owned banks and shit. I think they were strong arming people. Yeah, I think he was like loan sharking people and yeah. stuff. Yeah. I never yeah. heard about him doing it. But I know they massacred a bunch of cops one time. I yeah. know they was like... Like bloody... Uh, responsible for construction. They built cities and shit down there. You think about no, Scarface, the no, movie. Because no, in the see, movie... Seen, like, in the movie that happened... I seen somewhere Scarface. where some people were just like... The mobsters were like... Doing something with the banks, and I don't know if they have they stock, market, arm them stock markets and shit. Do like this or else. Yeah, but that was very interesting, guys. Let us know what y'all think about that one, guys. Y'all know what to do now.